What's that? Yeah. Well, we'll go ahead and get started. Maybe others will show up. Who knows? Um, all right, and That's Chuck. Cool. I'll, uh -huh. Okay. Yes. Yeah. I'll let you since you since you wanted to get out the Bible. I'll, okay. Thanks. I'll let you uh, read our opening passage for this morning. So this is uh, if you go to Revelation chapter okay. seven. Uh, verse, all of it's going yeah, oh, okay. no. no, no, <laughs> we're, we're going to look specifically, uh, Revel Revelation 7, verses 9 through 17. Okay. There you go. It's the great multitude. All of number? No. No, that's, no. A, that's a great multitude from every nation. Uh, <clears throat> after this, I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from all tribes, and the peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes, with palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And all the angels were standing around the throne, and around the elders and the four living creatures, and they fell on their faces before the throne and worshipped God, saying, Amen blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Then one of the elders addressed me, saying, Who are these clothed in white robes, and from where have they come? I said to him, Sir, you know. And he said to me, These are the ones, these are the ones coming out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore, therefore they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will shelter them with his presence. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst no more anymore. The sun shall not strike them, nor any scorching heat. For the Lamb in the midst of the throne will be their shepherd, and he will guide them to springs of living water, and God will wipe every away every tear from their eyes. All right. Uh, let us pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, you have given us the vision of what lies ahead, of the myriads and myriads of people gathered around your throne from every tribe, tongue, and language, and that they are all there because they have washed their robes in the blood of the Lamb, your Son, Jesus Christ. That he has died to atone for all of their sin and that he has been raised to show us what that life will look like. We give you thanks that you've called us to be your own and we ask that you strengthen us with the Holy Spirit that we may proclaim this good news to others, that they may come to that final feast gathered with palm branches in their hands and singing your praises forever and ever. All these things we ask in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Okay. So I uh, brought this up for this passage in particular up for two reasons. Um, one, because of what it deals with, what we're going to talk about today, uh, but two, also to, to relate and kind of tie back to um, what we, the topic we were talking about, cultural Marxism, um, there's no real end goal for them. It's, it's, they want this utopia, but they don't know what that looks like. Um, they're, only in their mind it is uh, a balancing of power, an e equal distribution of things, of resources, and whatever. Um, you know, that, that that's, that's the utopia that they're going for. And that's something that has to happen in this world. Whereas we say, no, there is something even greater than that that lies ahead of us. And that's what this uh, vision uh, given to St. John in the Revelation, uh, it, it reminds us of. Uh, that there is, at the end of time, it will be a multitude of people that no one could number from every tribe, tongue, and language gathered around the throne, praising God, and they're all there because of what Christ has done for them. So we see that that end goal, and that's that's what God has planned for us, and we recognize you know, kind of our role in that is that we tell others about Christ, and we ourselves come to, to know Christ and know him more and more uh, because he has forgiven us our sins. He has reconciled us to God. He has promised us that which lies ahead. So um, that's part of the reason that, that I, I bring this up is that it, we have a definite end goal. 
we know where we're going. And in one sense, you know, we're trying to get everybody else there. Um, and that's, you know, that starts with our families, extends to our, our church community, and then extends to our community at large. Uh, and the hope is that God brings them uh, with us. So the second the, the reason and what we're going to get into today um, is because this is a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from all tribes, all pe and peoples and languages. Uh, so that this is a universal calling. There is no one that is excluded from this. Uh, however, what we when we get into what we're going to talk about with critical race theory, uh, that becomes this is the, the big problem with this is that it becomes exclusionary in that regard based on race. And we'll talk. We'll break these terms down uh, in a little bit uh, because we're we're talking specifically about race, but you could substitute in there gender or. Uh, orientation or uh, even there are this this is actually a discipline uh, whiteness or whatever there's a whole bunch of things that can fit into this critical theory I'll, I'll get into that later but uh, again it's for us it is to remind us that there there is no one that's excluded from what God has done uh, I said last week there's only um, one type of people in this world but everybody falls into this category, and that is sinners for whom Christ died. If we look at them based on any other category, we're not actually doing them justice because they, their, their initial, who they are, everybody is a sinner for whom Christ died. And our hope is that they recognize that and that they believe in Christ and so they know that their sins are paid for and that they are uh, promised everlasting life. I don't think they will recognize that because they That's, can't. Well, the reason they can recognize it is God calls them. Exactly. And that's, but that's also, but that's. It says if he knocks on the door, you open it. Cool. Yeah. But that's, well, that's a little different, but uh, but you're, you're right. That's if God calls them. And how does God call them? This is what we read last week in the small catechism, in the third, in the art, oh. explanation of the third article of the creed. Yeah. Uh, so the Holy Spirit is the one who calls, gathers, enlightens, sanctifies, and keeps in the true faith. So you're right. And that, that happens when the word is proclaimed. And that was why also last week when we talked about like how do we respond to this. I, I said the, I think the best model for that is the creed. When we actually proclaim the truth of the creed. There is a maker. Who made there's God, Father Almighty, who made heaven and earth. Everybody's accountable to that. Um, and then there's Jesus, who has uh, died and risen again, who's purchased and won me, a lost and condemned sinner, not with gold or silver, but with his holy precious blood and innocent suffering and death, that I may be his own. And that there's the Holy Spirit who calls, gathers, and lightens us by the gospel and, and keeps us in the one true faith. And so that when we speak that truth and when we speak that to uh, the, the philosophies and just to individuals, maybe the individuals don't even understand this philosophy, which is something we'll talk about as well. Um, but they do understand, okay, there is a, a maker. I'm accountable to him. I haven't done what's right. How, do I, how, is, how is this made up for it? I've got good news for you. His son came and did it for you. And right. Our, our, our job hasn't changed one bit. Correct. It's the same as it's always been. We just got some different terminology and the fact that we have a lot more people in this country to witness to. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it, it's it's not going to change for the better. It's going to continue, but our job is to tell him what he's done for us. And whatever they put up there, this is all the devil's way yep. of getting people, putting people in and thinking they're all right and yep. they don't need God, they just need what they think is right. Yep. The, and that's wrong. Yeah. Um, there's several things. So there was a study that came out this past week that said the, the number of people who believe in God and we don't even know what God that is, is down to 81% in the United States. I so, don't believe that for a minute. Um, I believe the number. Yeah, there's nothing past that statement. 
Right. You know, do you believe in God? Said, yeah. If I there mean, was eighty-one percent, you said, you know, do you believe in the God? You know, Abraham, Jacob, Isaac, Isaac Jacob, Jacob. Right. They would say, "Who's that?" <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well. So yeah. Yeah. They, you know, <laughs> what? What is their God? Exactly. Right. It's not and the same God. Exactly. Right. exactly. So I think people. You know, there's all kinds of creation. And that's again, again, that's why the creed comes in as so important. Well, I could tell you who my God is: Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Yeah. And this is what He's done. Um, and then uh, the the other thing with with that, that uh, this and it's not know, exclusive. Either. What's that? It's not exclusive to us or inclusive to us. I mean, God is there for everyone. Yes. I mean, yeah. So yeah. when people say, "Well, you know, you guys don't like those type of people, or you don't let those type of people in your church," or that's all false, all one hundred percent false. All right. Yeah. The <clears throat> yes. The people we don't let in our let in our church are the people who are unrepentant sinners, because they at that point are saying, right. "My my choice, my identity, whatever the sin is, uh, is more important than what God has said about that sin," and that's that's a big problem, especially. And this gets into the philosophical movements and stuff, but in the, the 1600s, there was this kind of shift from. Um, truth being uh, revealed to us from outside and trusting in uh, these authorities outside of us, particularly the Bible, um, and to this shift of I get to determine truth. And so, and that's really where our uh, biggest problems are in culture and witnessing because it's they realize when we actually talk about a God who holds us accountable, that means I'm accountable for my choices and. If I if I say well, no, I don't I don't want to be held accountable for that. I I'm fine with that sin, which is the what you're talking about with that kind of influencing of the devil, right. and that comfortability with uh, or comfort with sin. Yeah, um, God doesn't mean that. But just like right. you told Eve. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly, exactly. And that's same that's, thing. That's always what it comes back to is you know. Did God really say? Did that? God really say? Yeah. So, anyways. Um, so critical, critical race theory, and this is a uh, it, it's it's a, it's emerged as a, a contentious topic um, in our society. You know, there have been uh, school board meetings and uh, legislation and stuff that has been brought up about it, and uh, there, in one sense, that's good, but in one sense, it's not because it. it, it I, I think there's a it demonstrates a, a misunderstanding of actually what the problem is. Uh, and we'll, I'll, I'll talk about that in a, in, a, in a little bit. But critical race theory itself is uh, this, really in a sense, it's a malleable thing. Um, it's a, it, there's no a strict definition of it. I was like doing research on this and had probably seven different sources and all of them gave different understandings of, and explanations for it. So that's one of the concerns with it is that it's not this easy to pin down thing. It's it's uh, more, like I said, malleable, nebulous than that. Um, however, what can be said about it, it is what it evolves from. Um, it's cultural Marxism, which is what we looked at the previous six weeks or so, uh, that's the larger kind of umbrella for it. Critical race theory emerges from that line of thinking, specifically with the the, the uh, model of oppressor oppressed. That's always floating in the background, um, but it also comes from this uh, what we call what or what academics call critical legal studies, okay, which is a, a a certain type of approach, still with that same kind of oppressor oppressed uh, model, but it's a, a looking at uh, legal work and uh, body laws and policies and that. Uh, so that's really, it, it's, it emerges out of that. Um, and the, the reason I bring that up is this, this first word is actually the kind of the key. So, and there's actually, there are, there is a field of study uh, in theology. In, well, I wouldn't really call it theology. Um, I guess it's philosophy, history, uh, 
that employs this against the Bible. I don't know if you guys have ever heard of the historical critical method. It's the same type of, of thinking. Uh, this concept of critical uh, in, in the academic realm and such, uh, I would say has a negative connotation, but academics would say just positive. But it has to do with basically not being sympathetic to whatever you're studying. In other words, we're not looking at it and, and gleaning from it. We're looking at it to find out what's wrong. Okay? We are taking a critical approach to it. We're trying to find the, the errors that are in it um, and uh, in order to, to problematize it. Ultimately, and this is specifically true with the historical critical method of, of the Bible, ultimately to undermine things that we disagree with. Um, and if you want to take that on its uh, on its course, that's why we end up with denominations that in are in so far uh, well, what we consider liberal, but so far away from what we we confess as the truth. So you go to a, an ELCA church, even as Lutheran in the name, probably still has crosses and such uh, around their building, has a liturgy, and has all that. But fundamentally, their beliefs have changed because they have taken the critical approach to the Bible, saying, "I'm whatever I disagree with or whatever I don't like, I'm going to find and problematize that so that I can undermine it and then recreate what I want it to be um, and, and preach from that. It's an oversimplification of it, but that's basically what it comes down to, is, is, a, is approaching a subject not as a sympathetic person to it, but instead with a critical eye to find the problems and then, or, or to find issues and then problematize them so that I can recreate it to my benefits. Critical legal studies emerged in that same kind of thing of, of looking back at laws and saying, wait a second, here are problems um, and, you know, let's, let's bring those to light and, you know, not read the law sympathetically or any of that, but actually find what's wrong problematize it, and then try to change it from there. And that, again, the primary uh, paradigm for this criticism uh, is on power dynamics. You know, if somebody, if the, uh, if this group or this person made this law at this point in time, uh, you know, they're already, uh, the, the critical approach to that would be where there are already biases and put and placed in that, and you know it's it's not neutral it's whatever and we need to undo that to to parallel that to the to the bible to um what i was talking about with the elca that's what they look at when they look at paul's uh you know exhortation that the you know homosexual offenders will not enter the kingdom of heaven they're saying well paul is just writing that in his context so they're critical to him not saying that this is actually the authoritative word for christians and then say, since he's writing it in his context and he's under those own, his own biases, we can get rid of that. And so because we can get rid of that, that means we can replace it with homosexuality is perfectly normal, perfectly fine. So that's, that's, again, oversimplified, but that's, that's the same type of thinking that's going on. So that's the kind of background to what ends up becoming uh, critical race theory. CRT, as it's known for short, developed in the aftermath of the civil rights movement. Uh, again, and this is, uh, uh, well, paralleling what Gramsci did with uh, Marxism. So, remember back to the culture of Marxism. Marxism, the economic model, didn't catch on. People were wondering, why didn't that happen? Gramsci was one that kind of thought about that and said, well, it's because of these things. It's the power structure and that type of stuff. Well, that same type of thought, that critical thought, uh, came up after the civil rights movement. And it was, okay, all these laws have been made to uh, you know, make people equal, um, but there are still disparities between black, primarily blacks and whites. And it's, the question is, why is that happening? Well, this is where these theories start to emerge. Um, the power structure... And, and this was the assumption from critical legal studies that carries forward, that the power structures, power structures were the reason the disparities were still happening. Power structures specifically defined around race and in placed, uh, uh, and they were, in, they were put in 
in place to advantage certain races over others. Moreover, the CRT proponents, um, they use statistics to justify uh, these things, but when they consider those statistics, it's usually often only based on race. It's a univariate analysis. So in other words, they see a problem, uh, easy kind of uh, thought with this, you know, uh, black population is only 13% of the United States, yet the prison population is like 62% black versus 38% white. Um, so they, they look at that and they say, that must mean there's a disparity, and it must be a problem with the law. And that's the only way that they look at it. They don't consider, well, uh, you know, the 62% 60, of those black men or women who are in prison, was it something else that factored in that? Were they, were they uh, you know, did not have a father in the home? Did they, you know, uh, predisposed to uh, a drug culture by where they were living? Or any of those things. Um, so it's, it's just simply literally looking at black and white and going, there's got to be a problem because these things are not distributed correctly. And so that's really where critical race theory itself um, develops, is saying, here are these disparities. There, it must be because of, of race right. and, and, not, and nothing if else. If we say it's because they're, they're, they committed a crime, they're in jail, then that's because, so yeah, but you got to consider they committed a crime because yeah. of the neighborhood they lived in, because yeah. of the fatherless, because of the... Right, but then they would, but then they would say, uh, their response would be, well, that is all because the legal things and the and the cultural, because that's, that, that is one of the, the things that changes, is that it's, it's, it moves out of just simply legal codes, but looks at cultural uh, or sociological factors. And says, but they would say, well, all those things are there because of race to begin with. So, you know, and, and that's that would be their, their argument against it. But, yeah. Ultimately, that's what it comes down to: is they don't. There's there's no deeper analysis and figuring right, out. Right. And I, I'll just I'll go ahead and bring this up at this time. Um, this book that I've mentioned before uh, in here, uh, Fault Lines. Dr. Balcom takes uh, several several of these kind of uh, cases to task um, in uh, in in his book. He does a, a really good job of uh, really. Peeling back, or, or actually not peeling back, but actually going further into uh, the statistics and the stories to say, you know, hey, you guys are making up a narrative over here that would be true if you didn't count all these other things. The problem is you have to count all these other things. And the gentleman Thomas Sowell that I was uh, referring to uh, before class, that's uh, almost exactly what he's done out from the economic perspective. Uh, looking at hard data and saying these things aren't adding up right. So anyways, he's uh, would be another one. He's not, well, I don't know if he's a Christian or not, but he doesn't present it from a Christian perspective. But, uh, Dr. Balcom is a, is a pastor, and so he's presenting uh, from a theological context. So, um, and often with this, and this is, and this is just true in, in, in life in general, but if, if you've taken a statistics, a statistics class, you should know that correlation does not mean causation. So in other words, uh, because it's, it's uh, I'm trying to think of an easy example, uh, because everybody that gets cancer breathes does not mean that everyone who breathes will get cancer. You know, statistically, that's, I mean, that's, uh, if, you did, if you took a, a, a poll or whatever, you asked how many people breathe, well, it'd be 100%. And, but how many people get cancer? Well, it's you know, 30, 40%. So correlation does not mean causation uh, in, in that regard. And that's one of the things that gets kind of brushed aside with this uh, specifically, but then other studies in, in, in general. How did you ever so, get interested in this stuff? Because of, because of what, was, what was happening with um, Concordia. I can't. Because what was happening with Concordia, Wisconsin, um, and Concordia, Ann Arbor, uh, in terms of the uh, you know, that that these things were being uh, taught, and, and I put that in quotes for a reason, 
um, at the at, at those institutions. And there was a professor who called it out. Well, that professor got still to this day uh, suspended because he wrote a critique of of the of the administration and the faculty that were promoting these things. So the faculty um, was promoting this kind of stuff. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, it's Why? it's a, what's not. Well, promoting. because it goes back to what you said, the devil likes to mm -hmm. sneak his lies in there. Mm -hmm. And that's, and, and this is, that's part of what we're going to get into uh, with, especially as people say, you know, there have been rallies to say, don't teach our kids critical race theory. Well, in a real sense, they're not being taught critical race theory, because this is a, a very high academic level Content just in, in just talking about it here. Yeah, I mean, we'd see I'm that, sure it's, it that it's that it's what we above my head. Yeah. <laughs> but but what has happened is that these things, as well as the cultural Marxism that we talked about earlier, the, the, the um, those things have infiltrated that realm of academia, and so that those who are training the teachers to go out and teach. They're just talking this stuff. Yes, but they don't even realize that so they're talking it. It's already it's already embedded in their <clears throat> thing. And I'll and I'll give you a perfect. How did they get that? In? How did that happen? Uh, time and unawareness. Right. Uh, and and again, so we, you don't really hear people say uh, we're cultural Marxist when they're walking around no. and stuff, but you will hear them say we're social justice warriors or social justice. Right. But it's really those terms are synonymous, and that's that's it. It goes back to uh, something that Chuck brought up: changing the language. If I can, if I can code it in such a way that it sounds good to you, it'll just slide by you. And then, especially in the generation that are being formed and molded, these these terms that that, that seem innocuous. We talked about this at the very beginning, but terms like diversity. We just read from Revelation 7. It sounds like it's a pretty diverse population that's around the throne. So diversity sounds good. Um, inclusion. Uh, stepping aside from, from recognizing that that's like a, a term for LGBTQ and such. Uh, but inclusion, who doesn't want to be included? It sounds nice. Equity. Uh, that you know people are, are treated fairly. Sounds good. But... Those terms have been co-opted in, in the Bible itself. God judges the nations with equity. Um, so, but those terms have been co-opted in such a way, and then no one's noticed the way they're being used now, and that ends up influencing the culture. So, when it's, when we talk about uh, people rallying against uh, schools and, and, and places that are teaching critical race theory, it's not really that. It's that they're teaching from the principles of it that are already embedded. They got it shifted the standard. Yes. Well, of course. That's the problem. They shifted the standard. They made the standard different. And the, and those professors and that stuff, they should never be able to. The new teaching. That should have never happened. Yeah, but but if you want to if you want to survive as a professor, you have to write. Sure. If you want to write, you have to come up with something interesting. And if you come up with something interesting that's nobody's thought about. You, 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 you make your way uh, into the money. And it's and I, I, I hate to say it, but I, I think that that's, I, I've listened to some of the, the proponents of critical race theory and, in, and, and, and some of the other things as well. And really, that's what it comes down to. They found this niche little thing and they said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hammer this home and I'm going to package it in such a way that other people will listen to it and they'll buy into it and that's it, it, you know that's what happens um, yeah. and then they end up believing it sure. and you because of teacher fresh out of school so how are they going to object to it you know, correct so they're told and to teach they're yeah. going to teach it they want it, to well, exactly. that's, all, that's what they were taught yeah right. it's i mean it's it's in it's it's in the textbooks now that it's that, that this is how things are and so again are the, are our schools really teaching critical race theory no academic high you know, graduate level courses, yes, they, they might have a class on that. But are the frameworks for teaching, are the textbooks for teaching, are the, the models for all of that heavily influenced by this and other cultural Marxist teachings? Yes, it absolutely is. And like I said, I'll give you I'll give you an example of that in a second. But so so that's one of the, the, 
the, the kind of issues with uh, critical race theory itself is that it, it, it's not, unless you're in a class that's like titled that or that looks at race studies or something like that, it's, it's really not uh, attackable in that sense. That is also one of the reasons why the church has bought into some of it. Because it just, again, it sounds good, it comes down, it's not this standard, like I said, I looked at seven different sources of you know, all different definitions of how to talk about this. And so in one sense, the, the church just will pick up on little parts of it and say, oh, that sounds all right, and they, they kind of go with it. But again, it's this, uh, this goes all the way back to, to, to Marxism and to Gramsci and to their thoughts about how to employ this. It's a re-education and indoctrination in this way of thinking. And once we get enough people in this way of thinking, then revolution occurs. Uh, so, all right. So I'll, I'll, I'll give you the, the tenets of critical race theory as kind of compiled from these different sources. All right. The first, and this is this was in this was in every one of them. Um, this is that racism is normal. It is inherent. It is everywhere. It is ubiquitous. So what is, is how does, what's their standard of racism? Well, I'm glad you asked, Barney, <laughs> because that's one of the big issues with, with this first tenet. This, again, going back to changing words, co-opting words, making them different, the definition here has changed. Okay. Re when I say the word racism, what do you, what do you think? Like, well, I think it's one person against another, one ethnic group against another ethnic group. It doesn't okay. necessarily have to be black and white. But mm -hmm. It's all over the world. Half the world is fighting because they yeah. don't like each other. Yeah, because they got look at the the Russians are fighting the the, the Ukrainians because they think they're Hitlers and they're and they're. It's racism. It's yeah. just as simple as that. Yeah. So we can we can actually go back to biblical times, Jew, yeah. Jew and Gentile right. racism. So Still and you're right. So there is a there is a an, uh, typically it starts with an individual, but those individuals like align as a group and declare, you know, this other group right. based on, you know, skin, ethnicity. Uh, nationality say you're an inferior group that's brother against brother you know well yeah that's the, thing. I mean, the, it's just how it is that that, that, that it definitely ends up Our playing into nature it. is right well, which don't stop they're, talking they're, not, they're not they're not they're not they're not working with that framework but you're, you're right and that's and that's and that's actually how we should understand the world um, because that's how God reveals that the world works this way brother against brother and my brother my brother's keeper evil. right um, but that's not that's not where they're going. But that definition, that, that's kind of the old understanding of, of racism. Well, I say old understanding. I think it's the proper understanding of racism is to treat someone uh, based off of their skin color, ethnicity, uh, background, a biological kind of feature for them as inferior because of that. That's typically how the world has understood it and how, how we understand it. And so that requires, in a, in in a uh, in one sense, an actor to to say that. In other words, you can't have uh, if something is racist, it means a person is enacting that against someone else, another individual. There's no just it's not nobody's doing racist things. It's actually uh, a white person saying a black person is inferior. A black person saying a white person is inferior. A Jew saying a Gentile is inferior, a Gentile saying a Jew is inferior. Like there's an actual individual thing. But they, and the proponents of this group, have switched that definition. Racism is, an inst is institutionalized in policies that preserve racial disparities. So, it, what's that? Racism is now defined as is, is, is institutionalized in policies that preserve 
racial disparities. In other words, if I see a difference between two groups, and this is going back to the statistics part, that it must be, if it's particularly black and white, it must be because of race. And it must be because the policies are racist. So all of a sudden, it's moved from this definition of actors being racist over against to now, really in a sense, this inanimate thing, a policy being racist. So, uh, and they again, this, this is where the legal studies ties into it. They, they're looking at and saying, well, these laws must therefore be racist because they're what they're producing are disparate outcomes between the races. And if they're disparate outcomes, doesn't matter the fact the other factors, if it's race, that must mean racism. So that's where uh, this it, it, that's where they say it's normal and inherent because our country was founded on racism. So that's everything the argument. could be racism. That's that's exactly what they're saying. Right. They, no, they, they wouldn't say could be. They say everything is everything racist. Everything is racist. Yeah. We Which is, all these things. Yeah. Uh, so if that's true, so are they. What's that? <laughs> if that's true, so are they. No. Uh, no, no, no. Because no. because they're the racist group. Exactly. Right. There is there is this sort of immunity to it if and this yeah. goes back to those cultural Marxism categories, if you fall into the, the category that is not disadvantaged or not, or, or, or if you fall into the category that is disadvantaged or you fall into the category with the disparate outcome. Then, that's just your opinion. Well, that's, well, <laughs> yes. Isn't but it? I, 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 no. What you they can would, have what one they black would, person to think this way, another black person to think this way, or another white person to think this way. Right. But, it's all opinion. No, but that's, that's again, that's how you this feel, comes out of cultural Marxism. We don't deal with race the way you do because your father taught you to feel this way, and his father taught him to feel it that way. And you can't change that. You can't. You can't all of a sudden not be racist because it's inherent in you. It's, yes. it's part of your upbringing. And that's who you are. And in fact, and. This that's what they about. teach. I'm not yeah. saying that's what it is. And, and in fact, it's 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 more than just your family. It's yeah. the culture itself sure. embeds it in you. Yeah. And what you're saying, and this is one of the right. the the, uh, the the big proponents of this, Ibrahim uh, <coughs> X. Kendi, if you mm -hmm. uh, if that name is sound, that's why he writes how to be an anti-racist. It's not enough to to, to mm -hmm. be not racist. Right. You must be anti-racist, which means I'm getting ahead of myself here. Sure. means going against the policies and things that are right. uh, there. There's right. people who think here in Milan that we made the black people live out south of town. That that's the property that we gave the black population. So they wouldn't move into the Milan city property. That's, 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 they believe that. I've had people tell me that. You know, they go, you know, all the black people live out there south of town. That's because they were forced to be put out there. Not, they couldn't come into town. So, we're in no, no. Joplin's moved into town. Joplin's moved into town. What's that having time called? That's really the north. That's the north. Now, to me. Yeah. Now, now, but what I, but what I. So, and then he became a coach and everything. And then yeah. he blew it all apart. Yeah. How could that ever happen? Well, then. Right. The right. problem is, the other people that live with us in, right. in town are just like the rest of everybody Absolutely. else. So, Absolutely. So, can their own race be racist against the, the opposite? So, so, yeah, so uh, it, it falls, it's not really in this, but yes, yeah. it can be. Um, because, again, it all draws from that oppressor-oppressed paradigm. Right. So, Barney, if you are if you are a well-off white male versus Chuck, who is a very poor white male, there can be conflict right. and not racism uh, Based on ethnicity, but at that, uh, 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 that you're an oppressor and he's an oppressed in that regard. Right. So, and that's really the, the, these. This term is really about oppressor and oppressing, and that there's always oppression, and that it's embedded in the culture and in the policies. That's straight out of Marx it's, uh, and cultural Marxism. So, oh, I, I never <laughs> felt jealous of. Exactly. Well, 
I, I'm tickled to death what God has given me. I'm it, amazed well, because he even and, chose me. Because, <laughs> and, and, but that's, you know what I mean? It's, it's just amazing. Right, and that's an, that's an important understanding. That's why we talked about the Ten Commandments way back in, in the beginning. Because we look at the world completely differently. We say God is maker of heaven and earth. He's created all things. He's the one who blesses us with things, and that He holds us accountable for those blessings. How do we, how do we use it? How do we conduct our lives? And how do we do it in such a way that we honor Him and serve, love and serve our neighbor? That's a completely different mindset than something that comes out of. Well, yeah. Well, don't a, act a, like this. A, a place, right? <laughs> I know a, a, a place that does not have that definitive accountability. The, the two commands: love the Lord your God and love your neighbor. If we loved our neighbor. All this stuff would be, and that's what we have to talk yeah, about, right? You know, right. But that, and, and again, so going back to the disparate outcomes and disparate things that are, um, you know, wh where they come up with this, they don't count sin and the fallenness of this world in that. And if you remove that, well, so they don't count their own shortcomings. Correct, uh, or or the or the or the sin that has, if. If a, a family is growing up and their father gets, the father has a heart attack and dies. Family, and a father is younger, gets COVID, dies. And those children go on to you know, not uh, be productive members of society, they get jailed or whatever. Uh, you know, that's, sin is actually the cause of that, in a sense, because if there were no sin, the father wouldn't have died. And if there were no sin, that the, that may have had a, a, a positive influence on the children. If there were no sin, those children would not have made, would not have been tempted in those choices. So, in one sense, it is like when you don't count that, you have to find some other reason for it, and that's what that's what all this is is so, coming out of. Mm -hmm. Do you think if the devil hadn't tempted Adam and Eve, they wouldn't have sinned sometime in their lifetime? <laughs> um, do, no, because they were already thinking about. I think they would have. I so I think yes, because even before that, the plan was to send Jesus into the world. Maybe, so, well, was, maybe it wouldn't have been Adam and Eve. Because it yeah. would have maybe the been sin didn't surprise God. Correct. So yeah. yeah, he knew that ahead of time yeah. that what was going to happen. So, it was so. Okay, so it's uh, everything. Everything is 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 racist. Was gonna, there was a, uh, a one. Of, what, I listened to Doctor Balcom actually speak uh, on this, and he he kept. Have you guys ever seen the Lego Movie? Yeah, yeah. a little bit. Okay, there's a song. Unfortunately, in there <laughs> with there's, my grandkids. I, right. I I I kind of enjoy it, and there's a song in there, and it's just this really catchy pop earworm it's everything is awesome everything is cool when you're part of it anyways dr balcom gets up there and he's like that's what i think of when i when i hear this and he goes everything is racist and he just starts, right. starts right. talking because that's their assumption that everything sure. it's embedded and baked into the laws and there's and, and in a real sense there's nothing you can do about it i'm going to read something to you you're just lucky that Barney the dinosaur is not out anymore. <laughs> yeah. I, we have, we have, we oh have, God. we we have some Barney. Uh, we had some Barney videos, and I Did do you? think, yeah. Oh, and if I remember correctly, that was started by a Lutheran. I think an LCMS Lutheran. Really? Yeah. Oh, so, I used to hate that. And, anyways, <laughs> all right. So I'm going to read something to you. Okay. Racism is a system consisting of structures, policies, practices, and norms that assigns values and determines opportunity based on the way people look or the color of their skin. This results in conditions that unfairly advantage some and disadvantage others throughout society. That was a definition given for what racism is. Mm -hmm. Sounds very different than what we're talking about as an actor versus another actor saying, mm -hmm. or a group of people saying, right. you're inferior because of this. They're, they're specifically highlighting it is a system consisting of structures, policies, practices, and norms. Do you know where that's from? I mean, it's, I, I, it could be from anywhere, so it's a random guess. I know. <laughs> that was from the Center for Disease Control website. What does that got to do with 
So, uh, that's my point. It's a federal program that has said this is what it is. I, I don't know how I ended up. I was looking at the CDC for something and, and, and saw that. And it was just like, wait a second. And it fits perfectly into this. So, again, going back to we're opposing teaching critical race theory, it's, it's, it's already there. It's how the world is thinking. So, all right. And as we consider each of the, these kind of tenets, um, uh, we also need to consider what is, uh, what's, what's wrong with them. Why is this, why is this problem? Uh, let me see if I've got everything there. So, uh, yeah, racism is not a rare occurrence. That's the other thing. Whereas when I was growing up and down in the South, I didn't meet very many people that were racist, but I did meet some that were. Some that legitimately did not like black people because they thought they were inferior, because they thought all the problems in the world were because of black people. You know, so I, I, it was it was not, in the South, it's, it's more frequent than, I would assume, uh, than other places, but it was not, that was not, that attitude was not the, the consistent attitude across Kentucky, at least where I grew up. But uh, this assumes that that's everywhere. But not not simply because of the individual actors, but because of the policies and, and, and stuff, and the system, as the CDC website says, the structures that are in place. Uh, so it's inherent in the fabric of our culture, and, and they trace this all back to slavery, which is very interesting. Going back to that gentleman, Dr. Soule, he makes the case that not slavery is not a result of racism. Racism is a result of slavery. And so that it was, in in a sense, that after the 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 conditioning, the the types of people that brought over slaves in the South, their lifestyle, and then the conditioning of that over generations of of having slaves made them racist. Versus, they went over because they thought they were superior. The slave trade was already happening. For that, and it was happening around the world. Uh, time. So, anyways, very they interesting. They don't realize their own people sold them. Yes, their own people That's, had slaves. Right. It was not well, and that gets into that. Gets they into, get rid of their own history and, and make up something else. And that gets into some of the, the the tenets of this. And again, back to to cultural Marxism, is that it is not uh, history is only valuable when it serves. My their, story. Their story, yeah. yes. So, because, um, you know, we don't we go back to, correct. To, to way back to putting stuff uh, in Egypt some of, for two, 250 years, but Pharaoh mm -hmm. was in charge of, of Egypt. Mm -hmm. well, and they had all kinds of slaves. Well, yeah, and uh, this book that I was listening to in the presentations talking about the Arab slave trade and how mm -hmm. that was so much worse uh, in brutality than uh, than generally speaking in the well, United States. What the Romans was. So, well, if you didn't do this, you were dead. Yeah. You know, you you know, it didn't make, and it wasn't just black people, it was right. anybody. Yeah, it was. You know well, what I mean? And that was, that was one of the things that, uh, one of the conclusions, it was people who were vulnerable. In other words, people who could be taken over, they were taken over, and they were taken advantage. That's all they did, year so, after year. When the spring came, they went and marched to try to take over somebody else's stuff. It was yeah. and, and, and that's, that's what workers. they did. Every country, right? Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. workers. How good and that and that's where and that's where it gets into economics, which is where, right. where Dr. Soul is coming from. So. Yeah. Okay, but all right. So we've mentioned some of this, but what is what is wrong with? Because this is this is, and again, this is another thing where. Uh, critical race theory is not simply a, a tool or an analytical thing that's out there. It's a worldview, it, and it's it, it's evident in this itself because it assumes everything is racist. So it's all of a sudden painting the world in a particular light. So we can't just say, you know, it's a it's a tool, it's a helpful thing. No, all of a sudden, if if you if you assert assent to this, you are saying that's how the world is. And it so, in other words, it becomes a worldview at that point. But what is what is wrong 
with this? What are some of the issues with this? Well, everything's not racist. Okay. Because that's not the way we think as a Christian. Okay. What is it that we as Christians say is the problem? Sinful nature. Sinful nature. Okay. This, again, it will qualify. We don't accept any 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 uh, 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 responsibility for this. Okay. It's only so, uh, somebody else. Correct. So they will qualify racism as, particularly the racist that they're talking about that's embedded in the structure as as sin, and they'll say that that's America's original sin. But they won't actually talk about the sinful nature of people. So it gets rid of it, it again. And this is Marxism coming out. It goes to the group-wide sin, but not individual sin. And the individual, um, you know, whatever led to slavery. And this is, again, this is a whole different topic. Um, but, you know, was it greed? Was it the economics and, and you know, mm -hmm. that, that led people to, into this? Was it the desire for power that led those stronger to inflict their will upon people and make them slaves? You know, all, all those things. That's kind of written off, that sure. that sinful nature would drive you to it. And well, it's all because they needed food. And I, if they give me some work, I'll give them food. Yeah. Well, none of that. You know, no. It, and yeah. and it's, it is it is simply, it is, this is this is that, and it doesn't account for individuals' sins. Right. And it qualifies, like kind of what you're saying, Barney, that there are groups that are immune to this. There are groups that are uh, righteous, uh, in, in, as, as how some of them, uh, have actually used those words that that can't be racist because of where they come from. And then there are other groups and that, that that group is namely black or non-white. And then the other group, the white, they're inherently unrighteous and there's nothing they can do about it. Uh, and that comes out in the language again in this this uh, another book, a White Fragility by uh, Robin D'Angelo. Uh, it's a New York Times bestseller, but she she's a proponent of this as well, and she talks about how basically white people are inherently guilty and they just don't even realize it right. of, of this. Um, that's where those terms white guilt, white privilege, um, white equilibrium, white ness comes out. And so, but yeah, in, in this worldview, it does not account for actual individual sins. Does not hold a, uh, individuals accountable for their individual that sins. That is as racist as you and, can get. Well, yeah. <laughs> I, 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 what's that? What do they do over in Europe? Like, you know, what does the queen do? Because she has white servants. Yeah. And so that's. Do they have this issue over there? And that's that's one of the things that I have not actually heard about or found out about yeah. uh, is how this would apply in other countries, and how, if they've even thought about these things. Because I'm willing to bet the answer is no, because this comes out of a specific response to the civil rights movements and the disparities there, so that it's only really contained within the borders of the United States. I was gonna say, this is just the US. Yes. Yeah. It's our, our laws made by white people that put black people in jail, right? cool. that's how they think. In a sense, yeah. Or, or, or not put them in jail, but put them at a disadvantaged true. Uh, true. position, yeah. true. Uh, oppress them, correct. Right. And so, and that's, and the, the other part of this is, if you were, if you're ever discussing this with somebody, you in one sense, you can't step into, you, you can't argue on their grounds because they will, they oh, will uh, wrap you up and, and just pour on things sure. that, right. you know, mm -hmm. uh, you, because again, it goes back to this is a worldview. This is how the world operates. And so when you step into that worldview, you're given all the truth claims, specifically from the Bible, specifically about sin and redemption. Uh, you're giving that all away to them at that point so when, you're, when you're talking. Uh, but yes, I, I do think this is very much a, a United States thing. And, and probably one of the arguments they would make is because no other country has done, uh, has a racism problem like us, which is completely untrue. You, just, you, you go to the different tribes in Africa that are genociding each other. Um, is that you go to the, the different the different groups of Muslims, the Shia and the Sunni, that go back and forth with each other, um, and then the Kurds and the you know, so so. But that's why this is such a a, a contentious topic because it, it's it's almost like. When we're standing up against it, we're too late. 
It's like we're already downstream yeah. from it. Yeah. And, and the question then is, uh, how do we as, as Christians respond to this? And uh, again, the first thing is to not step foot into to their arena and play their game on their terms, but actually to speak truth about, hey, God made everyone in his image. God redeemed everyone in Jesus Christ. And God has promised, as we heard from Revelation 7, that at the end of all time, it's going to be all groups of people from every tribe, tongue, language, uh, skin color, ethnicity, nationality, all of those who confess Jesus Christ, who wash their robes in the blood of the Lamb, they will be in his kingdom forever. 